Okay. If I can um, call this meeting to order and welcome everyone to this, the 10th meeting of the Public Petitions Committee in 2019. We have four items on the agenda this morning. Agenda item one is the consideration of whether to take agenda item four in private. Are members agreed to take item four, consideration of a draft annual report in private? Great, thank you. The next item is consideration of two new petitions. The first new petition is petition 1718, lodged by Alec Wallace, which calls for body cameras to be introduced for all NHS frontline and theatre staff. In his petition, Mr Wallace states that he considers the use of body cameras would act as a deterrent to verbal and physical abuse being directed at NHS staff. He also appears to suggest that this would protect patients from abuse by staff. The briefing prepared by Spice and the Clarks refers to the Scottish Government's Health and Social Care Staff Experience Report of 2017, which sets out figures on levels of abuse experienced by NHS staff. It notes that there are no corresponding figures for the level of abuse experienced by patients at the hands of staff. In this petition, the petitioner explains that use of body cameras for other emergency services has had a positive effect. Paragraph 8 of our briefing lists benefits as described in a 2015 report by the International Association for Healthcare Security and Safety. The report also highlights concerns around the potential impact on privacy, patient confidentiality and the relationship between staff and patients. Our briefing also refers to a recent pilot conducted by Northamptonshire Healthcare NHS Foundation Trust and addresses in further detail the issue of data protection. The Scottish Government does not appear to have a policy position. I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. Rachel? I noted that the Dignity and Work Survey um, found that 29% of staff had received verbal or emotional abuse from patients in, from the public in the last 12 months, and that's quite considerable. I think it reflects um, why perhaps ScotRail had brought in some uh, use of um, cameras uh, to, to the organisation, obviously with the choice of the individuals, the employers, as whether to they, they use them. Uh, or not. So I think um, there is a case here, and I do think that we need to find out more about it and how body cameras could be of use. I think, this, I think this is actually a, a really interesting petition. Um, I mean, on, on the initial response to it is, is you're looking at cost. Now, I'm just like, I, I know it doesn't mention this particularly in the petition, but, but this becomes such a uh, a litigious society, and I think our, our healthcare professionals are under so much pressure now uh, that they seem to, you know, spend half their time justifying um, decisions that have been made, they, they have made in, in, in the workplace. Um, and that I just wonder whether this this could have a really positive impact on that kind of uh, on that kind of outcome in terms of time away required to in in. in not even litigation, but explaining to uh, super, you know, the, the managers why they took certain actions, and I just wonder whether the, the, one of the, the byproducts of something like this would be to, to positively impact on that, on that kind of uh, that kind of issue. Angus, yeah, thanks, <coughs> Convener. Um, given the success of body cameras and other emergency services, I can see why the petitioner, uh, Alex Wallace, has. Uh, uh, has submitted it, and I welcome the, the petition. Um, you, you mentioned the uh, Northamptonshire Healthcare NHS Foundation Trust pilot, uh, which seems to have had some success, uh, and that it found their, their use was acceptable to both patients and staff, uh, and it resulted in a reduction in incidents and complaints. Uh, so I've, I have a lot of sympathy for the petition, and uh, I would hope that it can be investigated further. Um, but clearly we need to seek the, the views of a number of stakeholders before we can uh, proceed with the petition. Okay. David? Well, thank you, Convener. I just feel that if the body cameras are going to be used, I think they would act as a deterrent. Um, and when you look at the number of incidents there amongst the NHS staff, the personal ambulance and the staff at Castaire's Hospital, which had the highest incidents, if body cameras are there, they will be able to catch it and not only um, probably deter um, people in several incidences from uh, committing things like that. I suppose you could see it, on of yours, you could see it in A&E &E on a Saturday night. I don't know whether it deters anybody who behaves really badly in that kind of setting, to be honest. Why would they do it in the first place? I, I suppose I'm interested in, you can see it in the, in, for the emergency services or in A&E, &E, but it's also suggested it's in theatre. Um, and I just wanted, I'd be quite interested to hear from 
um, people who, who work in the health service, particularly health care unions, whether they have a view of this, because clearly there's an issue about protection of staff, but we've also seen very recently the way in which undercover uh, journalists with cameras have exposed terrible abuse in some of, um, in, amongst, for some very vulnerable people. And I wonder, I, I would be interested in, in whether the unions themselves have looked at this as a protection for them from false accusations, but also perhaps um, people who, who, who use the health service, I mean, I don't know, some of the patient organisations that, that, that represents of patients might be another group that we might want to work. I'm not sure if I would, I don't, maybe it's just me, I think there's something about the relationship between somebody who's going for help and the, the medical profession that, that the camera feels quite intrusive, but that maybe be something we need to look at what the limitations in that would be. Right. I mean, interestingly enough, I mean, in terms of cameras and theatres, that that already happens. Um, they're already live streaming. Uh, that, that with obviously between medical professionals, they're already doing that. Um, there's a, and and a, a friend who actually wears a a camera on, the, on his on his uh, glasses uh, when he's performing surgery. So that already that, that I mean there is a precedent that that already happens. What what we're actually talking about here is is making it more formal. Mm -hmm. Rachel. Uh, there are um, onboard cameras as well in, I don't know if all ambulances, but uh, I know certainly um, uh, a case of where it, it was used as evidence um, in a situation in England where, um, you know, it was taken to the pro to procurator fiscal and the, the evidence of the, the way that the patient had um, suffered was used as evidence. So therefore, there are ways through CCTV and onboard cameras currently, not sure in Scotland, but um, I mean, whether this just could be complementary to that, I think we'd have to look at all the ways that um, cases are being monitored. Yeah, and I suppose we would also be interested in the balance of cost and benefit to, you know, if it's something that's hugely expensive, then what are we trying to stop? What is, what's its purpose? I think that would be, so I think we're agreeing tonight, Scottish Government, to get their view. Um, and other key stakeholders, I think particularly the unions, um, Scottish Ambulance Service, patient groups, um, and possibly we could also write to Northamptonshire NHS Foundation Trust on, on what their findings were. Anyone else? There may be an, an issue about um, the whole question of confidentiality, I suppose, so perhaps the Scottish Information Commissioner could yeah, look assist at the data with protection. that. Yeah. Okay, is that agreed? But I think we should certainly thank the petitioner um, for giving us plenty of food for thought and we'll see if we will look forward to getting responses to that. Okay, if we can now move on to their second new petition for consideration today, which is petition 1719 on the review of fire safety stay put policy lodged by Rachel Gibson on behalf of tenants of Gart Craigs Road. Petition calls for the Scottish Government to review the current stay-put policy as it applies to the fire strategy for existing multi-storey residential buildings. The Scottish Fire and Rescue Service provides advice to residents of multi-storey flats, generally considered to be buildings of six storeys and above, on what to do in the event of a fire. Current advice for residents is to stay in their flat if a fire occurs in a communal area or other flat and only leave if they are affected by heat or smoke or are told to do so by the police or fire service. Different advice applies to residents if a fire occurs within their own flat. The petitioner's position is, position is that all residents should be immediately informed about a fire if it spreads from another flat in which the fire originated, as opposed to being informed about a fire through its heat, smoke or by the emergency services. In June 2017, the Scottish Government established a ministerial working group on building and fire safety. One of the recommendations from the working group's final report, published in December 2018, was the development of specific fire safety guidance for residents of multi-storey flats in Scotland. This guidance will be developed in collaboration with the SFRS and the Tenants and Residents Panel and is due to be completed by late 2019. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. Rachel? Well, I mean, the, the communication is key here in terms of that stay put policy, um, and it's not applied UK wide. But I think what I would like to understand is that the uh, local government and communities 
committee looked into these issues, but they didn't specifically look at that stay put advice, and they are going to return to it um, depending on their, uh, their their work schedule. So uh, it's a very good point the petitioner makes here, um, and we wouldn't want to lose sight uh, of of what is clear communication in that situation in, in a fire. So, uh, therefore, I think we should sort of hold on to it, as it were. I mean, there's no indication that we should pass it on to the committee to when they uh, consider their next uh, steps. So, um, yeah, well, that's it. I mean, I suppose what strikes me about it is post-Grenfell that this must be an issue for anybody who's living in a multi-storey building. And you can understand the con concerns of the petitioner that would want to get this clarified, that it'd be clear what would be the best approach, and also how do people make a judgment, how do they know, and so if there was somebody who had responsibility for letting uh, people know, then they would have a sense, they would know how to react, and I think it does point out to an area that certainly I would be looking for reassurance on, um, you would just, just simply, you know, because actually the put policy is only in certain circumstances, so, you know, I think... Um, quite rightly, residents and tenants would deserve some kind of um, recognition of certainty of what they should do, or as certain as you can be. Brian? If you put yourself in that situation, mm -hmm. if you're a flat above, mm -hmm. a fire, fire down below, you, 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 can, Im you can imagine the, the, you know, the, the serious concerns that you would have at the time, and your gut reaction would be to get out. So mm -hmm. I think I do think that's a very good petition. I do think it's something that, that uh, uh, we need to explore because uh, it has, as Rachel said, it has been explored in our committee. So I'd be quite keen to, to, to put this push this one forward. So I think there's, mm -hmm. a, there's a few people we could write to in the first instance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. So uh, just for information, it, it would seem that the local government committee, um, what their work was more in relation to building <coughs> regulations rather than to community safety matters. It may be something we want to flag up to them, but I think we should be doing a wee bit of work on it ourselves first. Um, I mean, again, Scottish Government, COSLA, the housing organisation, Scottish Fire and Rescue, um, and just get us, they must be thinking about this. Yeah, yeah. They must recognise this as an issue that's very, um, that people are very um, aware of and concerned about at this time. And, not, and actually, even just from the point of view of allaying people's fears, you know, I think Grenfell was a very um, particular set of circumstances and obviously that whole question about the safety of buildings and fabric of buildings has been explored, but this just a good practice of how, where is it best for people to be and how do they respond to fire. I think there's a, a more general point about how educated we all are about how we deal with these kind of emergencies, yeah. regardless of what kind of accommodation we're in. Is there anything else we should be doing? I just want to make an observation here on the, at the count last week i was in a building where um the, the fire procedure was uh given out to everybody in the room and it was a stay put policy um because that building was directly linked to the fire service and it's the first time i've ever been in a building where that was the policy it's oh uh, you know as a child we were all educated to get out of a building and there are standard and set ways that young people are educated to, to do things, to deal with things, mm -hmm. and dial 999. Um, and I just wondered if this it is such an important point because it can cause confusion, mm -hmm. especially with elderly people mm -hmm. and young people who have been taught to do things in a certain way and then are told a different mm -hmm. way. So whether it's something that actually will be um, after we get the... Uh, <coughs> get the evidence back from all these organisations that actually there could be different ways of teaching young people um, how to evacuate a building, mm -hmm. depending on the type of building. Yes, and, and is there, you know, so some high-rise buildings will have a concierge, some don't, mm -hmm. so how do you let people know what, what the policy is? Angus? Yeah, um, I, I, I hate to point this out, but um, there seems to be a bit of confusion even from the, the, the petitioner. Um, the, the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service advise residents to stay in their flat if a fire occurs in a communal area or other flat and only leave if, if they're affected by heat or smoke or are told to do so by the police or the fire service. Um, 
and different advice applies to residents if a fire occurs within their own flat. Now, the petitioner states that uh, the, the stay put policy is not applied UK wide. Uh, for instance, Greater Manchester Fire and Rescue Service advised tenants in high rise buildings that if there is a fire in any flat, they should get out and stay out. Um, but we are informed in our briefing that the stay put advice. Uh, was reiterated by the National Fire Chiefs Council in May, and Greater Manchester Fire and Rescue Service have the same advice as that issued by the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service. So you can see where there is all this confusion, mm -hmm. um, and it would be good to find a way, if we can, to to, to make sure that uh, you know the, the the advice is simplified and, and everybody knows what it is. Yeah, and I think the thing is, people have to have confidence in the advice mm -hmm. because, again, to go back to ground for people did as they were asked and then obviously tragedy um there was nevertheless there was a, a, a very significant loss of life so people need to be confident in what the advice is otherwise they'll just do what instinct takes them to anyway so i think from that point of view it would be helpful for us to try and establish the view of as we've said the scottish government cosla scottish fed the housing association organizations they would also have a view um, fire and rescue service national fire chiefs council anybody else no, I think that's a pretty substantial amount to be getting on with, and we did agree to um, those already. Okay, with that, can we again thank the petitioner, and we look forward to um, getting a responses uh, to that issue. If we can move now on to um, agenda item three, which is consideration of continued petitions. Our first continued petition is Petition 1533 on the abolition of non-residential social care charges for older and disabled people, um, lodged by Geoff Adamson on behalf of Scotland Against the Care Tax. And can I welcome Jackie Bailey, MSP, um, for this petition. At its meeting on 10th January 2019, the committee heard evidence from the Cabinet Secretary for Health and Sport. Following this meeting, we wrote to the Cabinet Secretary requesting further information on the costings of free personal care, how the extension of this free care is to be monitored, stakeholder engagement and causal care charging guidance. The Cabinet Secretary's submission explains that funding for free personal care is part of a block grant to local government and provides the latest figures available on those in receipt of care, as well as related costs. The petitioner has provided a response in which he raises a number of issues, particularly regarding the costings of free personal care and on what basis the Scottish Government has arrived at these costs. The petitioner also disputes the Government's estimates of average weekly hours of personal and non-personal care. This in turn affects the numbers of those eligible to benefit from the extension of free personal care. It did strike me that there's a, um, a lot of detail um, and a lot of technical detail in these issues, which I, I certainly found challenging when I was working through it. But I was particularly struck by the fact that the extension to free personal care is around service costs and not charges. And the idea that the government could be investing in more money and a significant number of people will be paying the exact same amount. And as far as I can see, so if you're saying... 80 hours and 40 of them are now going to be free, but there doesn't seem to be anything stopping local authorities doubling the cost of the chargeable bit, which means that this, it, they still end up having to pay the same amount. And I thought that that's something that we would want to um, explore further. I don't know what views people... I'm going to take Jack in uh, in a moment because I know she's got some um, observations on this, but I don't know if folk want to comment ahead of hearing from Jackie. Brian? It's kind of similar to, your, to, to yourself being around this this idea that, there's, that changing the number of hours, three hours, doesn't uh, preclude the, 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 the council from charging more. And, and, and that, there's, a, there's a, a, a dichotomy there around, around that. So uh, it was a, just a similar point to that. That's kind of, kind of come out to me as well. And the other point which he makes quite forcibly about the difference between an, um, somebody, the charge to somebody under 65 and somebody over 65, um, if I can find it in the evidence. But I thought it was quite... It, I found it very... took me aback quite a bit, actually, the, the gap. Um, and, it's, and it doesn't seem to be anything about anything except about the person's age. While I know that the government has made quite significant steps around Frank's Law and the petition that we dealt with, but you wonder whether... I suppose the question is whether the approach that's been taken is actually going to make the difference that probably most people would have, have hoped for from it. Uh, it says that there's a... It 
the states it's, it's not an equal tr uh, treatment and there's blatant age discrimination and the charging guidance sees that single people over 65 not pay charges until their income is over 210 pounds per week while single people under 65 pay charges when their income is over 135 pounds a week so the the petitioner is saying that this can mean that younger disabled adults pay as much as 75 per week more in charges for exactly the same services and it goes back to this thing about which I've, I don't know how you legislate on it, but I find it very compelling that it's about somebody's right to have a level playing field to, in order to be able to work and so on. And the fact that people may theoretically be entitled to care, but the cost of it is such that they are denying themselves that care and therefore the opportunities <coughs> they might have if they weren't disabled. And I think there's a big issue of equity there. Jackie, do you want to maybe make comments now? Yeah, I wonder whether I could and it, just make the comment that I think this petition is as relevant now as when it was first brought forward. Um, I, of course, support the issues highlighted by yourself, convener, and, and members of the committee about um, this anomaly of removing charges in one area and then they're replaced by increased charges in another area so that overall nobody benefits um, from the additional money that the Scottish Government have put in. Um, but I want to take a step back from that because that's one element of what I think the petition was driving at. Um, and frankly, in my constituency, the problem's getting worse. The cuts facing local government over time have been such that um, this has had an impact on social care services. And what many local authorities are doing is instead of cutting social care services, they're increasing the charges to pay for them. So we're moving even further away from the principle behind this petition, which is no care charges for non-residential services. Um, and whilst that problem is getting worse, let me let me just illustrate that in real terms, um, because I accept, you know, the government said to me in the chamber the other day that they're putting more money into local government. Well, something's not squaring up here, um, because in Western Berkshire, as an example, um, charges for community alarms, an essential preventative service, have gone up by 100%. So there are now more than 200 older vulnerable people who need community alarms that have cancelled them as a consequence. And I always understood our policy to be about funding prevention, and avoiding having to fund people in crisis, because when you're funding people in crisis, it costs us all and the system so much more that actually funding for community alarms is a preventative measure. It doesn't cost um, our system, if you like, a lot of money, yet it ends, ends up stopping people going into crisis. 200 in a month one month only have been cancelled. In learning disability services, what they've done is packaged three separate services that attracted three separate charges. They've packaged them together and increased that too by almost 100%. So it's touching on every section of the care sector, every different um, group of people. So I think going back to the wider principles of the petition um, would be very helpful. I make one general point before I come on to, to an ask of the committee. Um, I think many of us questioned at the time of the formation of health and social care partnerships how these would work because it was bringing together health, which is provided free at the point of need, with social care, which is not provided free. It's about an assessment of both your needs and your finances together. Um, and I think somewhere in that we've got the balance wrong. Because the whole point of having health and social care partnerships was to avoid people getting into secondary care, to provide care as close to home as possible. Um, and I think we're in danger by this charging policy or overcharging policy of creating more pain and cost in the system. Um, finally, I would ask whether it would be appropriate for this committee to invite the government to join with COSLA in doing a review. Now, I, I am conscious that our history is peppered with COSLA Scottish Government working groups that really haven't achieved that much. And I think in the past, I've been on record as saying um, if they were to receive performance-related pay, um, they would get nothing at all. However, that said, um, I do think there remains an issue about the inconsistency of eligibility criteria across Scotland. There are huge differences in the charges applied to people receiving social care, never mind there being no charge at all. Um, and whilst I respect a local authority's ability uh, to do things flexibly on the ground 
for their constituents. Um, nevertheless, in a country as small as Scotland, it is ridiculous that we have the level of charges and the inconsistency of approach. So I would respectfully invite the committee um, to perhaps consider encouraging the Scottish Government to do something. Okay, thank you very much for that. Brian? As, as, as I often say in these particular cases, and, and uh, I said Jackie Bailey's kind of uh, touched on it, there is an issue here that, that, that this dilemma with the, the integration, integrated joint boards, and the fact that, that, that healthcare is, is free at the point of of, uh, of need, and social and, and social care currently isn't, um, and and we're, we're still investigating that quite. Uh, 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 quite depth, quite a lot of depth at the moment around uh, that that sort of uh, balance. So there might be, and there might be a, a, a thing here where we could we can maybe pull some of the findings from uh, the health and sport committee. It might help to speak to that that, that very dilemma, or at least inform that very uh, uh, dilemma uh, uh, around the sort of two systems that are not quite uh, balancing up. And I think that's that, that's fairly evident at the moment. It's still fairly. Early, early times, only the last two or three years that the, the IGBs have been in, in force. So, I think there's, there's definitely some information that, that, that we could we could get in the short term around that relationship there that would inform uh, some some of our investigation here. Okay. Any other comments? Matt, sorry, Rachel. I just don't think that um, when we took evidence from the cabinet secretary that there was a sufficient answer as to why there was such an inconsistency in service. Uh, costs across the local authorities and yes we want to give local authorities the ability to deliver the best possible uh, care to to people um, and yes there will be uh, different needs because of geographical locations across local authorities but it seems that the service cost is just uh, uh, ballooning and uh, is making up perhaps for the fact that you know people are having to get free personal care. So I, I honestly don't think that the Cabinet Secretary had an answer for that, and I don't think that this, mm -hmm. uh, that the evidence has, has given us... I, I don't know how to square this. Mm -hmm. I mean, I suppose the, the question is, if you think, theoretically, there's free personal care, but then you tighten up the criteria for access to it, so rather than it being rationed by the cost, it's rationed by eligibility, and I think there's a big question here, how consistent... That is across the country, and I, you know there should be minimum standards wherever you are with flexibility for local authorities and rural and remote areas. I've got different challenges than, than urban settings, but I just was very taken, I think, because I very taken by the argument. They said they've made a move, they've changed the policy, but for the, the poorer you are, the less you benefit from it. And actually, you know, is there an, are, are we ending up having a policy? That we think we feel better about, but actually, in truth, on the ground, it's it's it's, it's at the very best no better. I think um, I mean, this, this is going to raise this the, the issue again around you know the balance between you know uh, implementation of a, of a structure from government to local local authorities and how much autonomy uh, we give to local local authorities. But it does strike me that that, that there should be a base, there mm -hmm. should be a base level that, that, that everybody works from. I suppose from the local government's point of view, is, is a question. Some of this will be about working the assumption nobody really wants to restrict access to a service, um, just for badness, that there is something happening around budgeting as well. Yeah. But I mean, I'm conscious that we've had this petition for a long time. It's a huge issue. We can't sort it all. I think, as has been said, there are some technical issues here that you know that about actually an implementation of a policy, so what an unintended consequence or a policy that's not fully fleshed out and it's having that kind of so I'm quite interested we do something more on it but I'm also conscious of our limits around this and I don't know we may want to reflect on whether the health committee at some point is going to look at this in more depth but I think we would want maybe to ask some more questions of government in the meantime I definitely think there's a clarification uh, around, around some of the as, as, as uh, Rachel Hampton said around some of the answers came from the Cabinet Secretary so I think, I think we could we certainly should be probing a little bit deeper and get a wee bit more in-depth answers from the Cabinet Secretary Okay, Angus? Yeah, I would agree, Convener um, we certainly look, look, uh, need to look into it in a, a lot more depth and there's certainly an issue um, as uh, highlighted by the petitioner and yourself earlier on uh, with regard to the extension of, of free personal care only um, 
changes the service cost ca calculation and, and not the charities aspect mm -hmm. that service users are asked to pay. Uh, and I'm quite struck by uh, Jackie Bailey's suggestion that um, there should be a, a joint working group between the Scottish Government and uh, COSLA. Um, given the complexities that there are here, uh, they need to be ironed out, there's no doubt about it. Um, so I would be happy to support that. Okay. Can I suggest then that we write the Scottish Government seeing clarification on the issues raised by the, the further submissions we've got and raise with them this question of a, uh, some joint work with COSLA um, and perhaps to COSLA as well, just to, to try and understand from their perspective um, whether that's something they regard as necessary, given that they, they exist as a, a, a body. Um, presumably they, they do think there are minimum standards that we expect from local government as well. Um, is there anything else we can do? Uh, just one thing. Um, please convene up. The, uh, the petitioner makes the point that the data uh, wasn't sufficient enough to make the policy development. Um, I mean, there is a list of uh, the data sources here in the brief, and I, I, I think we should be asking whether the data was sufficient enough to make these assumptions. Mm. Well, I think we can include the petitioner's submission in the correspondence with the government, and then because the, those points are made very clearly by the petitioner themselves, but and highlight that question with data. Okay. Okay. With that, can I um, thank Jackie Bailey for her attendance, thank and you very much, um, we'll certainly uh, look again forward to, to the response from the Scottish government to the petitioner's concerns. If we can move on. So. The next petition is petition 1652, lodged by Irene Bailey, on abusive and threatening communications. This petition was last considered in December 2018, when we invited the petitioner to comment on the final report of the independent review of hate crime, the Brackadale Review. The petitioner has indicated that while she thinks the report is fantastic, she is concerned that it does not cover the issues raised in her petition. The Scottish Government has indicated that it is currently considering responses to its consultation on the Brackadale recommendations. It maintains its position that there are potentially a number of practical difficulties to deliver what the petitioner is calling for, noting that some matters are reserved to Westminster. It refers to work that is ongoing on this issue, including the UK Government's White Paper on Online Harms and the Law Commission's review of the law in England and Wales. It states that it will carefully consider any proposals to change the law in this area where the relevant powers are devolved. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. Rachel? Bill had said that he, uh, he didn't consider that any further legislative changes were necessary at this stage, but then he went on to encourage the Scottish Ministers uh, to consider whether the outcomes of the Law Commission's work on online offensive communications identify any reforms which could be a benefit to Scots criminal law, cross-reserved and devolved matters. So, um, I, I believe that they are currently considering the responses received to the consultation. Is that correct? Yeah. Yes. So, so therefore, um, the Scottish Government will look at it from a devolved point of view, um, and I, 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 I welcome with interest it, you know, the results of that consultation. I think we need to think about whether we can take the petition mm. um, any further forward, and very specifically this idea that um, if a message is sent from your phone, that you're culpable for that. Um, and certainly the, the suggestion is that the Scottish Government um, does not accept that as, a, as practical, but I don't know what people's view on that is. I, while I understand and sympathise with the petition, recognise um, this is an important issue and online abuse is, is an important issue, I'm not sure if strict liability is one that that would actually be fair, or would it cause greater issues in the, the court system? I, 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 I'm, I agree. I don't think you can have strict liability. And, you know, if somebody gets a hold of your phone right by their laptop and fires mm -hmm. something off, it's, it, that, that's, uh, I think, would be very difficult to, to try and uh, hold the owner of that particular device to account in that. But, uh, I mean, th th this issue is not going to go away. It, it, it's going to it's going to keep coming back and keep coming back. Um, and, and it's not just an issue for Scotland. It's a global mm -hmm. a, a global problem here that nobody has managed to find a solution for. Um, but uh, as in, in terms of what's specifically been asked by the petitioner, I think that would be very difficult. Okay, Angus? Yeah, I would agree. I, mean, I think the main sticking point is this uh, strict liability issue. Um, and the government have stated 
uh, that um, uh, they're not convinced that, that the making and sending of abusive and threatening communications, uh, making that a strict liability offence would be appropriate. So while I can fully understand where the petitioner is coming from, um, there are going to be difficulties in implementing any kind of legislation that would include strict liability. Yeah. So in terms of um, taking the petition forward, I wonder what, I, mean, there are, I suppose that the, the main option really is to think about whether there's any further that we can do um, or should we close the petition and, this, and to underline, I think, the recognition and understanding of how important an issue this is. It's just a question of whether this is the right solution. I think that's what we're wrestling with. David? Uh, convener, I'm quite happy to close the position understanding rule 15.7, because I don't think we could take this any further. The Scottish Government, so OK. Brian? I, I, I recognise, again, as I said before, that this is an issue that's going to, it's going to occur and reoccur. Um, and, and we're going to have to consider, as a, as a parliament, let alone as a, as a, as a committee, um, uh, but re recognising that, I think what the, what's being asked for in the petition, I don't think we can take that any further. So I, I agree with David Torrance that in this, in this particular specific mm -hmm. issue, I think the only thing that's left them is just to, is to close the petition. Okay, Angus? Yeah, I think there is still some hope for the petitioner, though, because the, the, the Scottish Government does state um, that it continues to engage with the Home Office and the Department of Culture, Media and Sport. Uh, and it adds that it will carefully consider proposals to reform the law that fall within the devolved competence of the Parliament, uh, arising from other pieces of work, including the Law Commission's review of the law in England and Wales, which is undergoing. So, you know, th it's definitely on the government's radar, uh, or both government's radars, north and south of the border. So um, the petitioner should take heart in that fact. Mm -hmm. And I think it would be true the petitioner could still have the opportunity to engage in the work on the consultations that are ongoing, and I'm sure the clerks would be happy to give advice to the petitioner on how um, they might be able to do that. I think that would, again, you know, um, it would provide an opportunity really to kind of underline what has brought this petition um, to the fore and the issues behind it and perhaps be part of that consultation. Um, and... Obviously, as we always see, the petitioner has the opportunity to bring a petition back if they're not, in this case, if not satisfied with the Scottish Government response to UK work, and it'd be something I think we'd be alive to looking at again. Um, if that's the case, then can we agree that we're going to close the petition understanding Order Rule 15.7 on the basis that the Scottish Government has indicated that it remains unconvinced of the practicality and appropriateness of the action being called for, but has committed to consider any proposals to reform the law that might fall within the competence of the Scottish Parliament in light of the work being undertaken in England and Wales, and that we would encourage the petitioner to, if she, if she felt... Um, you want to do so to respond um, to that work, but also to take advice from the clerks and how she might engage with that. Um, is that agreed? agreed? And we would want to thank the petitioner for bringing the petition forward um, and appreciate the significance of the issues that have been raised. If we can now move to the next petition, which is petition 1674, lodged by Ellie Stirling on managing the cat population in Scotland. The petition calls on the Scottish Government to review the Code of Practice under the Wildlife and Natural Environment Scotland Act 2011 and to identify measures which could be introduced to control the soaring domestic cat population and protect the existence of the Scottish wild cat. We last considered this petition in November 2018, while the Government's consultations on the licensing of dog, cat and rabbit breeding activities was ongoing. An analysis of that consultation was published by the Scottish Government last month. The petitioner, whom we understand responded to the Government's consultation, considers that the proposed threshold set out in that consultation would not prevent a high level of cat overpopulation. She argues that this potentially could lead to more than 300,000 new pet cats per year not being able to find a home. The petitioner has previously expressed concerns about the risk of hybridisation between domestic cats and the Scottish wild cat and refers to a recent report by the Cat Specialist Group of the International Union for Conservation of Nature, which concluded that the threat of hybridisation is accelerating. While the petitioner considers that the level of support for the measures outlined in the government's consultation represents a step in the right direction, she argues that it's more a case of trying to change people's habits when it comes to acquiring cats. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. 
Brian. Um, I, think, I think at the time we said this, at the time it, it's, it's uh, the figures, the figures that are, are, are quoted in here are uh, quite remarkable. Not mm -hmm. something I would have particularly, uh, you know, considered um, had this petition not been brought to, to our attention. So I think the petitioner is right. There is a, there's a significant uh, there's a significant issue here that has to be addressed. I, I personally would quite like to see the cabinet secretary for the environment um, perhaps come in and and uh, and, and uh, speak to us about what what the Scottish government's position is in this, and, and that would then allow the perhaps in advance the petitioner in advance uh, to submit some questions to us that, uh, that we could put to the, the cabinet secretary. Okay. Any other views, Angus? Um, yeah, well, I would agree with uh, uh, Brian Whittle. Um, it might well be an idea to get the cabinet secretary in to to explain exactly what the Scottish government's position is. Mm -hmm. um, I can't help uh, thinking back to the, the the passing of the legislation for the docking of working dogs' tails and. Uh, the flack that uh, came from that, and, and you know, I'm just concerned that uh, maybe un uninformed members of the public who who see a, a, a culling of, of of cats or whatever in the future may may well respond in the same way. So it's a difficult uh, issue uh, to deal with, um, and there will no doubt be flack no matter which way uh, the government goes. But um, yeah. it's something that has to be addressed. <clears throat> There's okay, no Rachel. doubt about that. Sorry. I think there's going to be an impact here on the veterinary profession as well, and that there there is a group which is a cat neutering group, which is a coalition of vet and welfare bodies, um, and they advocate uh, pre, um, I'm not going to say it, but neutering of cats um, for welfare reasons. So I'm just wondering, should we not also be looking at veterinary groups who? have a say in this because at the end of the day it's, there's going to be a cost allocated to this and do they have the responsibility if um, suddenly the Scottish Government create a new policy about this who pays for this and is there an implication uh, that, that, that it becomes a, a free at point of source I know that a lot of the cat charities like Cats Protection I think they're called Cats Protection they offer that service they bring it they, they will bring in feral cats and you turn it and they'll also um, when they're home rehoming cats they, they do all of that and, and pay for the, the veterinary fees so there are a lot of people doing that on a voluntary basis at the moment so but it would be also interesting to hear from presumably if the, the cabinet secretary is looking at this they'd have to do an impact assessment they'd have mm. to look at costs and it would be unreasonable to say this should happen without working out mm. how it should happen um, I just I think I shared Brian's view. I'm quite alarmed by the figures, and I suppose it'd be interesting to get a sense from the cabinet secretary what the response is. But it would also, and again, as Brian has said, the petitioner can um, provide really kind of the key questions that she would want asked, um, very focused questions around this question that we would could explore with the cabinet secretary. Is that agreed? Okay, so we will agree to uh, formally to invite the Cabinet Secretary for the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform to give evidence um, and for the petitioner to take the opportunity um, to suggest questions that she would want answered and it may be that in response to the, the petition itself we may see further submissions from those who have an interest. Okay, thank you very much for that. If we can now move to the next petition, which is Petition 1690, lodged by Emma Shorter, calling for invest investment in biomedical research in a centre of excellence for ME, ensuring healthcare professionals' training and educational materials reflect the latest scientific evidence, and providing specialist care for patients and discontinuing graded exercise therapy, GET, and cognitive behavioural therapy, CBT, which the petition refers to as harmful treatments. We last considered this petition in January when we took evidence from the Cabinet Secretary and Chief Medical Officer. Subsequently, the Cabinet Secretary provided a written submission which reiterates the Government's commitment to ensuring that people with ME can access the best possible care and support. She adds that the Government will work with others to explore ways in which the level of research can be increased and will set up a short life working group made up of relevant stakeholders and people with lived experience to, quote, explore the provision of services and different practices across the country. The Cabinet Secretary acknowledges the need to increase awareness and understanding amongst health professionals and states that the Government will continue to work with representative groups, including ME Action Scotland and Action for ME, to work towards this need. 
The petitioner argues that the continuing use of CBT and GET go against the fundamental principles of medicine to do no harm. She and others who have provided written submissions to the committee throughout our consideration of this petition to date strongly argue that CBT and GET are harmful. In written submissions, the petitioner and Leslie Scott also query whether the studies or research undertaken, which led to the recommendation that CBT and GET could be used as treatments for people with ME, actually included any people with ME within the research cohort. The petitioner particularly notes the position of the US Healthcare Research and Quality, which considered that there was a, quote, high risk of patients with other fatiguing illnesses being included within that cohort. This position is supported by a submission by Mr Stuart Brown. He asks why the National Advisory Committee on Neurological Conditions has not reported on the care of people with ME and suggests that there is an urgent need to commission research to establish the prevalence and burden of ME. The petitioner also raises concerns about the issue of informed consent. She refers to choice without coercion and argues that treatment is often forced on children with ME using child protection laws. The submissions from Leslie Scott and an anonymous respondent appear to strongly support the argument made by the petitioner. In his submission, Mr Brown sets out concerns about the suitability of GET as a treatment and considers that the petitioner's case for withdrawing this treatment is indisputable. Members may also recall that at last week's general questions on 22nd May, the Minister for Public Health, Sport and Wellbeing responded to a question from Maureen Watt on behalf of a constituent who was concerned that ME is not included in the Scottish Government's draft neurological plan. Mr Fitzpatrick clarified that the National Action Plan for Neurological Conditions is not condition-specific. It covers all conditions, including ME. The Minister added that responses to the recent public consultation are currently being reviewed and said that the Government will take on board the feedback that we have received and endeavour to ensure that the final plan is clear throughout its intent and scope that it is for all neurological conditions, including ME. In response to a supplementary question from Miles Briggs on how levels of funding for research into ME might be increased, the Minister said that the Government frequently meets a range of stakeholders and would be willing to discuss this issue at the next meeting. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. Brian? We've also had a members debate uh, on, on ME, which, which uh, I thought was quite, quite enlightening. I mean, I think this, the, 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 the when we when we last had to we looked at this petition and, and when spoke spoke of the members debate, I remember saying exactly the same thing about the G E T and C B T mm -hmm. treatment seems to be um universally you know, being rejected at the moment and yet I, I did get in, uh, I had a couple of medics get in contact with me to to, to tell me otherwise that they you know just blanket uh, get rid of these treatments uh, was not the answer. So I think we're, what that tells me is we're quite far away, uh, in, in our, in our probably our understanding of not just this neurological condition but other neurological conditions. It's not that long ago when this was called yuppie flu, and mm -hmm. you know, uh, and this is one of the, the conditions that um, I, I always was under the impression that um, physical activity helped every single condition, <laughs> and then I was I've been proven to be incorrect in that. So I, I think we're quite a long way. Uh, not not just in ME, but we could probably bring other conditions, petitions that we've had into the, the whole. We're not going to, but, but, but you know, we could this idea, this idea of of um, it keeps coming up of, of needing to um, change the way in which we uh, train uh, train our medics. Uh, so I, I'd be really interested to see you know to get an update, perhaps. Um, on where the, sh the findings of the short life, life, life working group, particularly, and that seems mm -hmm. to be a reasonable first step here. Okay. Anyone else? Angus? Um, well, I just agree again with Brian Whittle. Um, we do need to find out where the short life working group is at, um, but it's also, you know, well worth noting again uh, the, the, the petitioner's submission uh, calling for the re removal of CBT. Uh, and uh, well, as as a primary treatment, and also uh, get or GET as well. Um, the submission from the petitioner uh, sets out five key issues. Uh, the first one: do no harm. Then lack of evidence that CBT or GET is uh, benefits people with ME. 
um, issue three is without informed consent, treatment is unethical, and issue four, evidence of abnormalities in people with ME. Um, so given uh, these concerns um, are paramount, I think um, if we're seeking an update on where the short life working group is, we, we, we could do with maybe getting a a face to face with the cabinet secretary and ask her directly um, where 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 they are with it. Um, so I'd be keen to invite the cabinet secretary in to the committee. And I, th I think we would want we could liaise with the cabinet secretary around timing and that because we would want enough time for them there to have been um, some progress. And I think we're agreeing that we would want to to hear from her in that regard. I was also very struck with the theme of some of the submissions for children with ME. Where is the training for those people who are maybe reacting in terms of child protection issues? And that the idea that um, this, there's an implication, certainly some of this, that it's about parental anxiety um, or a child simply not wanting to go to school. And again, a kind of a form of not believing that it's a health condition. We're not in a position to make a judgment on that, but I just thought it was an interesting um, and quite a worrying consequence if somebody actually has got a condition it's not understood inside the system, and then there's progress through to young people ending up with their parents in front of the children's hearing system. So I think it would be useful to hear from the Cabinet Secretary um, quite interested in what work has been done around training of GPs um, and to understand their, you know, their response to the, the written submissions that we've had. Yeah. Rachel? So, um, it, like you know, most health conditions, there there are the guidelines, there are the ways that GPs approach uh, um, a condition and the pathways that they take. Uh, but in this situation, it seems as though there should be a more individualised or bespoke approach rather than just a set or standard way to go about things. And I think that is the sense of frustration that I, when reading the letters um, from Stuart Brown, um, because you know, he's gone back and forward so many times to make his point. Uh, I do think there is, uh, there has been a little bit of progress, and the fact that the, the NHS um, Education Scotland will develop a training module for GPs. But what is that based on? Is it based on nice guidelines that are getting, uh, 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 you know, looked at, reviewed, as mm -hmm. it were, with evidence from those people um, living with ME? Mm. Right. Um, I, th I think also that the, 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 you know, the, the, the thing we explored the last time where the, the sort of ME specialists, um, there weren't exactly, you know, very many of them within within the community, um, even for a GP to refer to. Um, I think, and in, in, in what, what struck me within this is that we're moving towards this idea of, of you owning your own health in, in conjunction with, with with your GP, and if that's the case, this uh, this imposing of uh, a, a treatment will will go will will start to will start to fade away so inevitably that, that that whole education is going to become more paramount so it'd be just be the same. another thing i think would be worth noting to the committee is that we're we're still waiting nine responses from health boards and i think we might want to pursue that and also to note that the petitioner had specific questions to nhs borders and nhs lothian in, her, in the most recent submission, I wonder if we would agree to write to them, just flagging up these concerns. Okay, so we're agreeing that, and also to invite the cabinet secretary in to provide an update on the short life working group. And um, that at that meeting, we can also get a, um, an update in progress with the other issues. Um, and that would be in liaison with the cabinet secretary to ensure that it was a time when she would have something to report. So it'd probably realistically be after the recess now. Is that agreed? agreed? Okay, thank you. Um, if we can now move on to our next petition, which is petition 1696 on preserving Scottish Battlefields Lodge by Jack Gallagher on behalf of Bothwell Historical Society. Since our last consideration of this petition on 13 September 2018, a number of submissions have been received, including from the Scottish Government, which has made clear that they do not agree with the petitioner's view that there is no statutory protection for battlefields listed in the Historic Environment Scotland inventory. 
This is due to a statutory requirement for a planning authority to consult, consult with Historic Environment Scotland regarding planning permission to de for development on a battlefield. There is also a statutory requirement for planning authorities to notify the Scottish Ministers should they not adhere to the decision or conditions set out by Historic Environment Scotland. Evidence was provided of this power being exercised relating to proposed development at Culloden Moor as recently as October last year. Historic Environment Scotland states that all planning authorities with historic battlefields in their areas have planning policies that seek to protect and conserve those battlefields as part of the strategic decision making. They said the following about statutory protections. We are content that local authorities give adequate consideration to their own policies regarding the protection of battlefields and that they and other, they and other decision makers give sufficient weight to our advice. We therefore believe that the statutory protection currently afforded to inventory battlefields within the planning system provides an adequate level of protection and the relevant policies also provide sufficient weight to considering potential impacts upon inventory battlefields. I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. Rachel? It's in direct response to um, that the, the HES has carried out a, a review, a policy review, which is actually very interesting because they say that they want to keep pace and develop a positive approach um, that, that goes in line with um, modern life and using <coughs> landscapes proactively and positively. And uh, that some of the work that they're, they're going to be doing is, is more detailed work, and so that they consider how inventory records and maps could provide clearer information on the key characteristics, surviving elements of battlefields. I think that's really, really important because we know that communities uh, get very upset um, when a battlefield or a historic site is compromised. And I think that the, the, the level of... Um, uh, the, the level that they that, that they uh, expect of all planning authorities with regards to these historic battlefield sites is actually quite high. So, um, I mean, the the submission by Historic Environment Scotland gave me quite a lot of confidence. Mm -hmm. Yes, I agree with that. Any other comments, Angus? Um, I would agree too. I've, I've seen uh, Historic Environment Scotland uh, in action. Uh, out with my constituency, I have to say, up in the Western Isles, um, and they have uh, acted extremely responsibly with regard to some planning applications that have come in, uh, particularly with regard to um, the county stones. Um, so I, I, I would be minded to, to close this petition, um, convener, um, given that uh, I, I believe there are robust uh, systems in place already, as it stands. I do note that the submission of some of the petitioners, they, they don't agree with that contention. Yeah, I, saw that. Um, I did find that the, you know, that, that, that the response from um, the HES was substantial. Um, and, you know, I, I think we still have to recognise that perhaps that they feel it doesn't go far enough. Um, but I wonder if this stage, is there anything further that we can do? I think we have a shared commitment to preserving um, battlefields and other historic sites um, and for planning in that regard to be to be rigorous. Um, I suppose what we could say to petitioners that the very fact of highlighting it, um, the, the HES has had to be very clear of what they're doing and if they feel that, that that's not been sustained, again, this is something that they could come back to us on. David? Uh, thank you, Kavita. I just uh, feel that if the Scottish Government considers there's enough uh, legislation there to protect the battlefields and the reassurance from HSE, um, that I agree with Angus. I think we have to close the petition. Okay. Any further comments? No. Um, I think we are recognising the importance of, of the petition and what what has been sought for in the petition. And as it stands, we have um, um, accepted the evidence that there, there are substantial protections there. Um, so we would want to close the petition understanding Order Rule 15.7 on the basis the Scottish Government considers there to be sufficient safeguards to protect historic battlefields from development and that there is evidence of these being used in practice. Um, but we would emphasise that to the petitioner that clearly if they have um, further concerns they are able to submit, resubmit within a year and any evidence that they can provide that's a gap between what the Scottish Government is saying and the reality on the ground would obviously be 
um, important part of that petition. So on that basis, we're agreeing to close the petition, and um, we would want to thank the petitioner for um, their involvement in highlighting this issue to the committee. If we can now move on to our last petition today, which is petition 1706, on the introduction of a law to allow pets in rented and supported accommodation lodged by Geraldine Mackenzie. At our last consideration of this petition, on 25th October 2018, members agreed to seek the views of a number of organisations and received submissions from the Scottish Government, Shelter Scotland, the Scottish Federation of Housing Associations. We have also received a submission from the petitioner in response to these submissions. The Scottish Government's brief response states that while they recognise the benefits of pet ownership, quote, decisions around keeping pets are for individual landlords. Shelter Scotland carried out a consultation on this very subject and concluded, quote, we feel that while legislation may be an option in the future to consider to ensure that pets are reasonably accepted in private and social accommodation, we believe that other softer measures to encourage pet-friendly approaches may be more appropriate in the first instance. The SFHA expressed a similar view in that they expressed sympathy with the petitioner's aims, but they do not feel that legislation is required to allow tenants to keep pets. Most, if not all, SFHA members allow pet ownership subject to responsible pet ownership policies. They are also, they are also the view that, quote, no pet clauses are virtually impossible to enforce, as it would be highly unlikely a sheriff or first-tier tribunal would grant decree to evict based on pet ownership. The petitioner feels that the Scottish Government's submission was brief and unsatisfactory, as it only focused on individual landlords and did not cover the wider context of this issue. For example, pet, and pet owners seeking pet-friendly rental properties face less choice, which may reduce the quality of housing available to them. The petitioner is of the view that this lack of choice helps to create inequalities between the private and social rented sectors, and that legislation is required to address this imbalance. I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. I'd like to make a comment that I think the petitioner should actually put something perhaps towards um, the somebody to put something towards the stage three of the planning bill because actually it seems as though the, um, the uh, accommodation that's provided is not suitable uh, for people to take pets even though the um, the, the the organisations are welcoming pets. There's no, um, there's no facility to to actually allow people to come in with those pets, and it seems as though that um, the petitioner isn't going to get um, f very far with the Scottish government introducing a law, because um, th there, there could be another way. That's what I'm saying, and a campaign around it. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if it would be planning legislation. What strikes me about it is most landlords, most social landlords would allow pets and would have some kind of process, whereas if you if you don't look after your cat or dog or whatever and cause problems to other people, you would, they would have policies. But there's a particular issue about people who are homeless, who have dogs in particular, and they can't take temporary accommodation or shelter accommodation because they don't allow pets and people will choose to be on the streets. Now that's a very margin it's a small group, it's a very marginalised group. And it's almost as if the Scottish Government's not responded to that bit of the issue at all. I can see and I hear from Shelter Scotland and from the SFHA that, you know, nobody would get evicted for this and there's a general issue um for everyone about the antisocial behaviour of somebody who has pets. I mean I've dealt with cases in the past where folk disappear off for the weekend and leave the dog in the house up the stair from you and it doesn't stop barking for the whole weekend. Um, so there's issues of cruelty and all those kind of questions. But the very specific issue about for vulnerable people who maybe the only thing they've got in their lives is their dog can't then come off the streets because there's not any accommodation. I agreed with the petitioner that I thought the response to the Scottish Government was quite dismissive on that question. Whether we need to keep the petition open in order to write to the Scottish Government and ask them about that in particular, that would be a matter for the committee, I don't know. I think we have we can either um, close the petition because clearly the main organisations don't think this is a solution, or we could write to the Scottish Government and highlight these particular concerns and then make a decision. I don't know what views you have. Uh, I, th I think if you're, uh, exactly the point you made around uh, the, the relationship with you know, that small group of people choosing to be to be homeless rather than be uh, separated from their pet 
And it's one thing to say that um, they wouldn't evict anybody, it would be difficult to evict somebody with a pet, but how do you get in in the first place? Mm -hmm. there's, 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 that, there's that dilemma, so you won't be accepted into uh, in, into accommodation with a pet. So that, that kind of, to me, didn't didn't quite uh, didn't quite ring true. I think there's there's an issue there. So I would I would quite like to get a, get a, you know a further response from the government on that that specific point. Mm -hmm. um, I, don't know, I don't know much else we can do in this, but uh, okay. I think that that point certainly uh, raises it for me. Um, I, I came into this meeting this morning minded to to close the petition, but given uh, given your uh, <laughs> given your valid uh, point regarding homeless people uh, not being able to take their pets with them um, to support it to accommodation is is a valid point. So um, for you know for for that alone, um, I think we should uh, pursue it a bit further and 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 get some more answers from from the Scottish government. But I, I, can I just say that I, I note the petitioner. Uh, references a, a yet to be published paper that argues that pet ownership comes within the scope of Article 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights, which in part protects a person's home, family and private life against intrusion by the state. But having worked on the Land Reform Bill uh, extensively in the run-up to the last election, um, there could also be a, a breach of European Convention on Human Rights of the um, landlords, mm -hmm. you know, particularly yes. private yeah. landlords who may not wish to have pets in their properties. So, you know, we're in a kind of catch-22 situation yeah. there. Um, so, yeah, well worth pursuing a wee yeah. bit, I think. I think certainly the suggestion by both Shelter and SFHA is that there's a softer approach and a recognition of the importance of um, pets in some people's lives. And, you know, maybe older people, people are bereaved. I've heard people talking about, you know, the benefit they've got from that. It's another wee heartbeat in the house. Um, and so that idea that where people are perhaps vulnerable, they should be able to have a pet, but it's responsible ownership. And can you make it an absolute rule? I mean, if I were renting out a property, should I be able to say, it's my view that, you know, just to exclude it, and it's my private property, Should can you really constrain that? Was that something worth um, exploring? But I think the main thing really is around this question of what if there's a for a small group of people a direct consequence to them of not being able to take their pets into their shelter, then that's an area that we think the Scottish government should respond with more than just a couple of sentences. So we would agree to write the Scottish government um, on that issue. I think we'd want to thank the petitioner for raising. It's, it's actually a very interesting issue. Whether it's one of these ones where we suspect the legislation is not the, the place that's where it's going to be sorted, but even an understanding of the issues is going to, to help. Okay, with that, can I um, again thank the petitioner? And we're now going to move into private session.